Thank you, everyone. So today, I want to start by talking about launching a product. Product launches are super exciting. I can distinctly remember working on a really important project that culminated after several long months of hard work in a couple pressure-filled days that ended with that exciting moment where we flipped a switch and our creation was shared with the world. Once it was launched, we all felt some relief, right? The product was finally out there. We had done our due diligence, tested it thoroughly, squashed hundreds of bugs. We knew it was solid. Unfortunately, in the months that followed, things started to deteriorate. With each release that we sent out, the product started to feel a bit less solid. We knew everything worked because we were testing, but we got reports of it being slow, and some people complained about it not being accessible. It was functional, but the quality for our users was deteriorating. So we became faced with this problem. As we scaled our product and iterated on it, how do we ensure that we're consistently delivering a quality experience for all of our users? So my name is Trent Willis. I'm a senior UI engineer at Netflix currently and project lead for the QUnit testing framework. And today, I'm here to let you know that maintaining quality software is hard. It's really hard. But I'm also here to talk about the future, and specifically how the emerging technology for testing web apps is going to make it so much easier for us to help ensure that we're consistently delivering that quality experience that all of our users are expecting from us. So the story I just shared highlighted that one primary benefit of automated testing is that it gives us confidence that our software works. Having this confidence provides us with a lot of benefits. Right? We can iterate faster because we're not worried about breaking something, and it lets us fix bugs quicker. But it doesn't do a whole lot to prevent us from digging a hole in terms of quality for ourselves. That said, testing is still by and large a net positive for those of us that do it, and so we do it. But we've been using the same techniques for a long time. So today, I want to challenge us to start shifting our thinking slightly and strive towards the idea that testing should give us confidence that our software works well. Not just that it works, but that it works in a way that provides a quality experience for all of our users. But in order to do this, we have to define what is a quality experience for a web app. Well, that's a pretty subjective thing and will vary based on who you ask. But there are a couple questions that I've been considering related to this and that I want to talk about today. And so those are, what if instead of just telling us that our live web app is functional, our tests could tell us whether or not it was also accessible? Or what if our tests were able to tell us whether or not our small code change impacted the performance of our overall application? Or finally, what if our tests could let us know that we're actually using all the code we're shipping, that it's necessary for the user's experience? So these questions go beyond answering just, is our software functional, and start to address is the software providing a good experience for our users? Now, there are many more areas that we could be concerned with, but today, I just want us to keep these three in mind. So if we want our test to answer the question of, is our software accessible, performant, and actually necessary, how do we do that? Well, we need to start with some new foundational technology for how we test. So earlier this year, April 13th to be exact, a new version of the Chrome browser shipped a version that supported a headless mode, which allows the browser to be run without a graphical user interface. So it made its official debut in Chrome 59, and this was a huge deal because it finally made it easy for developers to set up automated testing in a real browser that they could use in their CI environments. Often, continuous integration environments don't support full browsers because they don't allow graphical user interfaces. So up until this point, a lot of developers have been using PhantomJS, which was a headless browser, but it often lagged behind real browsers in terms of browser functionality, and most importantly, wasn't actually being used by anyone that you're shipping your code to. And so because of this, any maintenance cost that you sunk into that wasn't going towards benefiting your users directly. And that's a problem, right? So other browsers, such as Safari, Edge, and Firefox, also either couldn't run without a graphical user interface or a platform dependent. And so those were out for your continuous integration environments as well. So Chrome having the support was really a tremendous step forward for us in terms of setting up real browser-based testing. But aside from this ease of use, 
The really big game changer here for me is that Chrome has an associated debugging protocol called the Chrome DevTools protocol, which allows for external tools to instrument, inspect, and profile the browser itself in addition to the code that's running. And so that gives us full access to the information that the Chrome DevTools have natively, and that's awesome. So now you might be familiar with a similar protocol called WebDriver that's been around for a while and often used to administer end-to-end -end testing via tools like Selenium. Unlike WebDriver, which is primarily focused on controlling the browser as a user would, the DevTools protocol is a bit lower level. It gives us access to a much richer set of data. So it can control the browser by navigating and administering events in the browser, like WebDriver does, but it can also let us get access to knowledge about how much code is executed or what the performance of the web page has been like so far. So this combination of headless Chrome plus a powerful new debugging protocol opens a ton of doors for us in terms of automating our web apps. So however, if all of our developers have to interact with this protocol directly, it's probably not going to be adopted that quickly because it's difficult to understand. But if we can build some abstractions around it and make it a lot easier for JavaScript developers to get on board and try things out, then doors will open a lot faster. And so this is what the Google Chrome team has done with Puppeteer, a node library that allows you to control Chrome using a simple, high-level, promise-based API. And so you can use a lot of the same tools and techniques that you're using in your day-to-day -day JavaScript development already. So with Puppeteer, you can do a lot of really complex tasks easily, such as crawl web pages or get a performance trace of your application. So as a quick example, here's some code that navigates to a page and takes a screenshot. The high-level API used here makes it pretty easy to read as we launch the browser, open a new browser page, visit the website, wait for the content to load, and then take a screenshot. This is a lot easier to read than the actual protocol statements, and by using native async await like Wes talked about, we get really clean automation code. And so I don't know about you all, but something like this excites me a lot because doing something as hard as automating screen captures of web pages in JavaScript used to be really difficult, but now we can do it in six lines of code in an NPM package. And that's pretty awesome. But beyond these generic abstractions like Puppeteer, we can also start to build tools that interact directly with our web pages as they run. So an example of this is QUnit in browser. This is a small extension for QUnit that I've been working on for a while now that allows you to easily write QUnit tests that execute against a live web page. So what this means is you no longer need to learn a completely new domain-specific language to do your end-to-end -end testing, and instead, you just write JavaScript tests using the same tools and techniques that you're already used to. And the only difference is that these will execute against a specific web page instead of in your test runner. And this is possible because the DevTools protocol allows us to interact directly with the runtime of the web page that we're visiting. So as an example, above we have a test where we visit a locally running web app and verify that the content is rendered. So this test can be run in a suite with other standard QUnit tests, so your other unit tests or integration tests. And yet, it'll be an end-to-end -end test because we can visit a web server that actually has some production data going to it. This means you don't have to learn a second testing framework for your end-to-end -end testing. You don't need to set up additional configuration, and you don't need to have a second test suite. And that's really great for our developer experience. So in short, this setup is a lot simpler and more lightweight than old Selenium-style end-to-end tests, and yet it can give you the same level of confidence that you're shipping functional and quality code. So at this point, you might be thinking, OK, so we have some new and potentially better tools, but a lot of this we could already do with existing tools. So what? How is this actually the future? So that's a good point. A lot of this we could already do. But with easier to use and more flexible tooling for our end-to-end -to -end automation, we can actually start to think less about how we're writing tests and more about what we're actually testing. So to put this idea in context, let's start by exploring that first area of quality that I mentioned, accessibility. So there are a lot of tools out there that have been around for a little while, but the most well-known is probably from the accessibility consulting firm, DQ Labs. 
And so this library, Axe Core, is by and large the de facto standard for automated accessibility testing in the industry right now because it's really easy to use in terms of its API and is built on the collective knowledge from a lot of people that are experts in this area. But in order to use it, in order to integrate it into automated testing, we often have to think a good bit about how we integrate it. Do I test my individual components? Do I put this in my integration tests? Or if I'm writing an end-to-end -end test, do I need to use the Selenium-wrapped API instead of the native JavaScript API? With an approach like the one Qt and browser takes, by injecting code into the runtime of our live web app, a lot of these problems just kind of vanish, right? Because we have access to full web pages as they're running, and we can verify accessibility in a holistic manner. So if we take the code from before, in just a few more lines of code, we can verify that our live web app that is running with production data is free of a whole swath of accessibility violations. Right? And this is really incredible because if we take this concept and add another layer of abstraction or just wrap it in a loop, we can verify that almost every linkable page in our application is free of accessibility errors. And this is tremendous for both our end users, because they now have an accessible site, and our developers, because this is relatively easy to set up. And that's really exciting to me, because the last thing we want is to develop stuff that people can't actually use. So on that note, let's shift gears a bit and get into some more nitty gritty stuff and talk about performance. So performance is a really interesting topic in computer science and one that actually has a direct impact on how our users experience our web apps. However, it's unfortunate that we often talk about it in terms of intuition or hunches we have or cargo-culted knowledge that we've learned from others, and not based on actual data. And even rarer do we talk about it in terms of data from our web apps. So we do this because writing benchmarks for performance is often time-consuming. It's prone to error and often not really helpful within an actual application because we usually focus on micro benchmarks that only test a small portion of our code. But since the Chrome DevTools protocol exposes information about a web page as it is running from the perspective of the browser, we can start writing macro benchmarks, benchmarks that are concerned with our application as a whole. These are generally less prone to the optimization error that micro benchmarks run into, and they give us helpful insight into how the user is experiencing an entire web app running at once. And if we apply some abstractions here, we can make it such that, the, that setting this up isn't a very time-consuming exercise. So Chris Selden, a software engineer at LinkedIn and an Ember core team member, has been working in this space for a while now, and he created a tool called Ember Macro Benchmark, which allows you to set up application-level benchmarks for any application, not just an Ember app, as the name implies. And these benchmarks control for network variance by using some pre-recorded network responses. And so what this means is that we can get relatively stable results over running our app multiple times and doing the same thing. And that allows us to get meaningful information about the performance of our app as it's running. So as an example, this is a box plot taken from the Ember.js 2.14 release blog post. It shows the improvements made in initial time to render, as well as overall JavaScript execution time for a real Ember application. So this was generated by Ember Macro Benchmark, and it allowed the core team and contributors to verify that the small framework-level performance changes they made over this, over this period of time were actually improvements for a real web app. They weren't just hypothetical or things that they thought might work. They actually verified it. And they could do this in a relatively automated way. And so this is super exciting because we can begin to track the performance of our application over time as we iterate on it. And because of that, we can gain confidence that we're shipping a quality experience that isn't slowly deteriorating over time. Or if it is, we can put guardrails in place to help us detect that. And so that's awesome. Now, unfortunately, the code to set this up is slightly too complicated for me to fit into this talk. But if you're interested, I highly recommend that you go check this project out on GitHub. So finally, I want to talk about code coverage. So code coverage often elicits a really strong, usually negative reaction from developers, because we usually talk about arbitrary quotas set for testing lines of code. But that's not really what I want to talk about today. I want to talk about code coverage in terms of code usage. And so what I mean by this is how much code are you actually using? 
for users in countries with developing mobile infrastructure or just high mobile data cost, the amount of code you're shipping can directly impact whether or not they choose to use your web app. And so, if you're sending code that isn't actually executing and never being used, you're performing a disservice to your users. Not only that, but you might potentially be costing yourself market share, and that's just not good business sense. So thankfully, Chrome added an awesome code coverage tool recently to its dev tools that shows you what code has actually executed from a given script or style sheet over a given period of time. So this was added in Chrome 59, the same release as Headless Chrome, and got its own tab in the UI. It allows you to see what code is executed in terms of file size from various files that were loaded, and will even let you drill down into it to see exactly what lines have executed. So by now, maybe you can guess where I'm going with this. Since this information is in the dev tools, it means that it's also exposed via the protocol, which means that we can begin to automate and collect that data and test against it. So this code's a bit more low level. Using the profiler domain from the protocol, we can begin to track coverage. And then if we perform some actions, say run an end-to-end -end test testing a user flow, we can collect the information about what code has actually been used for that. So we'll need to parse that info to make it usable, but once we do that, we can then track it over time to make sure that we're only shipping code that's actually used. And so this is great because we can not only do this for initial page loads and make sure our initial page loads are light, but we can also see if we have a really common user flow, like a user logging in, we can make sure that we're sending optimized bundles for that as well. And so this is really, really exciting to me because when we combine this with something like performance tracking, then we can begin to build guardrails that help us make sure we're consistently delivering fast and optimized experiences for all of our users. Not just the ones on fancy high-speed internet in modern countries, but those that are out in the middle of nowhere and don't have great signals. So at this point, we've covered a lot of ground. Our current reality in testing is that most of our testing is just geared towards making sure our software works, and that's a pretty good start. But with the advent of a real headless browser and a robust debugging protocol that we can use, we can begin to build really powerful tools for gaining insight into the quality of our applications in addition to the functionality. So to recap some of the ways this might manifest, let's revisit those initial questions that I posed. What if, instead of just telling us that our live web app is functional, they could tell us it was testing, it was accessible? They can, and by combining a JavaScript-centric end-to-end testing approach that works directly with the runtime with an easy-to-use JavaScript API like Axcore, we get this really easily. What if our test could tell us how our small code change impacted performance of our overall app? They can, and by collecting this data over time and using traces from the debugging protocol, we can start to get a holistic view of how our app's performance is changing as we iterate. Or what if our test could let us know if the code we're shipping is necessary and actually being used? We can start to do this as well by tracking code coverage information. And with that information, we can start to build assertions and tools and automated infrastructure around it. And so all this is starting to become a reality for web apps today. And these ideas that I presented are just the beginning. There's so much more that you could do. So the emerging tools for testing and automation are so much more flexible and robust than they ever have been before. And so whether you're launching a new product or maintaining an existing one, there are many opportunities for us to start building confidence that we're shipping the experience our users want and will enjoy. So the future of testing for the web is really bright, in my opinion, and I'm excited to see what you all will do with it. Thank you.